Hello, everybody. My name is Mary Vias. I'm the president of PSC Partners Canada, and I'd like to introduce the speakers for this session, Natural History Data, to support drug development for PSC. First up, speaking on the power of natural history data is Dr. Gideon Hirschfield. Dr. Hirschfield holds the inaugural Lily and Terry Horner Chair in Autoimmune Liver Disease at the University of Toronto and is a professor of medicine. As a clinician scientist, he manages translational and trials-based clinical science with the goal of advancing therapies that prevent the need for transplantation for patients with inflammatory liver disease. Following Dr. Hirschfield's presentation, speaking on what we have learned from PSC Natural History Initiatives, is Dr. Cynthia Levy. Dr. Levy is a professor of medicine and the associate director of the Schiff Center for Liver Disease at the University of Miami. She was awarded the Arthur Hertz Endowed Chair in Liver Diseases. Dr. Levy's clinical research focuses on clinical trial development and conduct for autoimmune and cholestatic liver diseases, including PSC. We will then hear from Dr. Cyril Poncion on measuring patient reported outcomes. Dr. Poncion is professor of gastroenterology and hepatology at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in the Netherlands. His areas of research are PSC and IBD. And he leads the International PSC Registry, encompassing more than 3,000 PSC patients. He also focuses on biliary endoscopy and leads a research line on microbiota in ulcerative colitis. Finally, following Dr. Poncion, I will be sharing information on the PSC Partners WIND initiative which is a PSC Partners sponsored natural history study initiative. Following these presentations, Dr. Hirschfield will be joining us live for a think tank discussion. Dr. Levy and Dr. Poncion are unable to be here with us today. Joining our panel will be Dr. Chris Bolas, who brings to the discussion his experience leading CALID, the Collaborative North American Natural History Cohort. For the WIND Think Tank discussion, we will be welcoming all patients, caregivers, researchers, and clinicians to share their questions and feedback of the goals of the WIND initiative. And that will be for the session following this one. So please welcome now Dr. Hirschfield on the power of natural history data. Hello, my name is Gideon Hirschfeld. I'm a hepatologist from Toronto, and I look after patients who live with primary sclerosing cholangitis. It's a pleasure today to talk to you about the power of natural history data to support drug development for people living with PSC. And in this talk, I'm going to focus around the data that we've generated in Toronto to try and give you some insights around why it is so important for us to have the WIND initiative. I think many of you have seen this slide that we prepared to teach people about living with PSC. The six C's of PSC cover the covert symptoms, the cholangitis, the colitis, the cirrhosis, and the cancer risk. But they also fundamentally cover the goal of a cure for this disease. And as you'll know, there are lots of efforts to develop new therapies that modulate bile acids, modulate bugs in your colon, modulate your immune system. And to find out whether these new drugs help our patients, we need to study our patients and measure biomarkers in their blood, urine or stool to see whether drugs are effectively changing the course of their liver disease. This means that we need to put patients into clinical trials, but we also have to have a reference. We need to reference against what happens in our clinic. And that allows us to have fewer patients in clinical trials of shorter duration, and then to compare with what we know happens to larger numbers of patients from across the world in the real world. You'll know that your disease is a very inflammatory and painful disease. This is the cholangitis in your bile duct. It is ulcerated and very sore. And this is the root cause of what is PSC. However, by the time many patients need to have a liver transplant, when we take the liver out, what we see 
is a scarred liver with lots of fibrosis and not so much inflammation. And this means we don't really always know what the best thing to measure is when we are studying our patients with PSC to predict what will happen to them. At the moment, what we do is we use the liver enzyme alkaline phosphatase frequently to help us understand whether a drug may or may not be helping us. And if I look at this slide of data from a patient with PSC, I would say that this drug is not helping our patients because the alkaline phosphatase has gone up during the clinical trial. I might say this drug is a great success because the alkaline phosphatase has fallen quite clearly during the clinical trial. Or I might say to you, in fact, there's just a lot of noise and the alkaline phosphatase bounces around and isn't the best biomarker for new drugs. To help us overcome this challenge, we need to learn more from what's happening in clinic to your blood tests over time and use that to optimize how we develop trials. In Toronto, we've been working on our own data and we've been lucky enough to collaborate with the Mayo Clinic to see what happens when we look at your blood tests over many years. So you can see that we've got nearly 600 patients in Toronto and many thousands of patients who've been to the Mayo over uh, twice the, the time course of our study in Toronto. And this gives us the opportunity to see what's happening in the real world. Our patients are young, predominantly male, um, but not exclusively. They have large duct disease, they have a lot of colitis, and their blood tests are abnormal. And this is the first starting point of any cohort study. What does the original cohort look like? What we've done is then look at all of the data, all of the time points when blood tests were taken, and we've worked backwards from where a patient needs to have a new liver. And we can then show both in our cohort on the left, the Toronto cohort, and we can validate it by getting more data from another center, the Mayo Clinic, that the patients whose alkaline phosphatase stays low is the patients who have the best outcomes over 10 years. And the patients whose alkaline phosphatase stays high are the ones who run into more trouble. So this helps us when we are using our data to guide the development of clinical trials. We can see that at the point that you start to become more jaundiced is a juncture in the journey of living with PSC. And you're more likely to then have an event. And if your bilirubin stays normal, this is a low risk category. And this is therefore an aspiration for our treatments to keep the bilirubin low and normal. The same goes when we measure the protein in your blood called albumin. And as the albumin falls, that is a predictor that there may be trouble ahead. And again, the two groups, the groups that run into problems and the groups that do well, separate. This is the power of using real data and looking at all of the data using complex statistics. The same goes for platelet count, which is a surrogate of what's happening to your spleen size. And as you know, as you get more scarring in the liver, your spleen gets bigger and your platelet count will drop. And again, we can separate the two groups. The last thing we started to look at is elastography. And at the moment, we only have our fibro scan data from Toronto, but we hope to put in MRE data, MRI elastography data from the Mayo. But we can see and we can validate that our patients whose fibro scan stays low are the patients in the low risk group. And as your risk increases over time, then your fibro scan is going up. And the same goes for some of the risk scores. The risk score we're showing on the right is the Amsterdam Oxford um, PSC index. And again, this is the power of cohort data. This is the power of looking in big cohorts over time. And the bigger the cohort, the more representative it is. Hence the importance of working collaboratively across the globe, North America and Europe, to put together what's actually already happening in clinic. I show this slide because this is not our data. This is data from a European and international study of PSC looking at FibroScan. And why is it important? Because we validate, we replicate, we show the same findings in our data from Toronto as has been shown from this international study of what happens when you use FibroScan to predict outcomes. The more we validate the messages we have, the more powerful those messages are and the more use they can be used 
in developing new drugs for patients living with PSE, because we can more confidently help design better studies and better analysis to show that the drugs are helping. What else have we done with our data? So you can look at big picture about blood tests, and you can also address individual questions. So this is an example of a study we used looking at real patients' data in Toronto, looking at whether or not patients have bile duct stones. So a proportion of patients living with PSC will have bile duct stones, not just stones in their gallbladder, but stones in their bile ducts. And we were interested, first of all, to find out how frequently this happens and what it means. So using real data from a cohort study, we find that one in four of our patients has got bile duct stones. We also find that those patients are slightly different. They're more likely to be younger, more likely to be male, and they're more likely to have large duct inflammation. So we've used real data to define who gets this problem and what it means. And the patients who had bile duct stones had more impressive and aggressive findings on imaging. So this teaches us something about how to interpret the MRIs of our patients and ultrasounds of our patients. So again, we are learning about how to live and manage patients with PSC. Those patients with stones in their bile ducts were also more likely to get infection, cholangitis, need an ERCP, which is to fish out the stones, and more likely to need a transplant. So this is a, a different kind of example of how real-world data helps us understand a disease even in 2022. Similarly, we looked at Toronto data and we collaborated with um, a US site, and this is work from Dr. Gulen Hussain, looking at gallbladder polyps, because we know that lots of patients with PSE can develop gallbladder polyps, and we didn't know what the correct answer is as to how to manage them. So here is the opportunity to use real data, not just for biochemistry, but for a question of clinical practice, what to do with a gallbladder polyp if you have PSC. So if I just go back, so this is what happened when you had a gallbladder polyp and you had the gallbladder taken out. It turns out that only about one in four patients actually had a sinister polyp. So that's good news but maybe that means we're taking too many gallbladders out. And this is what happens when you have your um, gallbladder removed and there is no polyp, then it's very unlikely that you'll pick up a sinister finding um, in the pathology. So again, this helps us understand how to manage patients living with PSC and to target where we need new therapies and new guidelines. Again, when we put all of our data together and we look at all of the ultrasounds that our patients have had over time, we start to see that we have plenty of patients who've got gallbladder polyps where nothing happens. So this is reassuring. This helps us tell a patient in clinic what they should do if we find a gallbladder polyp. So I've given you three examples of how data from our cohort and then other cohorts helps us understand what happens to patients living with PSC, helps us to refine the questions that we need to address, and therefore helps us to think about new drugs. So our takeaways are, the larger the data set, the more the data reveals. Patients living with PSC benefit from both raising awareness as well as contributing real-world data. And the next steps are to dig deeper and make this part of a sustainable data effort to address key questions. What is really happening to patients living with PSC in North America? What clinical parameters that we measure all the time can be used to predict outcomes? And can new diagnostics and treatments make a difference for our patients? So with that, I hope you have a very productive conference. I know it is all on Zoom, and therefore I've kept the talk short, and hopefully we can address any further questions at the discussion. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to join you here today to discuss the impact of natural history registries in supporting drug development for PSC. I'd like to thank Mary and Ruth Ann for putting this session together and inviting me to participate. So my task today is really to discuss what we have learned from the ongoing natural history initiatives with a special focus on Kali. Those are my disclosures. Okay, so as a background, 
we need to understand there are already several ongoing natural history initiatives around the globe. We have CALID in North America, the European Reference Network, the UK PSC, Scandinavian PSC database, and also the International PSC Study Group database, which is the largest one and actually encompasses a lot of the data, the patients that we have in the other registries. We have learned a tremendous amount from these studies. And to summarize the data, I actually have to uh, thank Palak Trivedi, who put together this systematic review of PSC natural history studies. The group looked for population-based studies, so very strict methodology, reporting incidence and or prevalence of PSC. And they excluded studies that focused only on children or only on patients who also had IBD. And they selected papers focusing on epidemiology, natural history, and outcomes. So out of almost 5,000 studies, 17 were included. Here on the right, I show you the incidence and prevalence rates for PSC in this many studies that were included. Incidence in blue ranged from 0 to 1.58, highest in Northern uh, European countries, as well as North America. And the prevalence ranging from 0 to 31 in Finland, uh, 23 at Mayo Clinic or Minnesota, uh, United States. Not shown here, most contemporaneous studies are showing an increase in the incidence of primary sclerosis and cholangitis, especially in the northern countries. Other findings uh, were shown here. So mean age at presentation has been between 40 and 59 years of age. The gender uh, only showing male predominance, although there is a variation here from 51 to 71 percent. And the coexistence of inflammatory bowel disease ranging from 20 to 88 percent, with these lower rates seen mostly in Asian countries. Only a couple of studies of all that were included and shown here on the right, only a couple of them showed fewer than 50% of patients having coexistent PSC IBD. Most studies will, will be 50 to 70% and some of the highest uh, proportion of 88. You see shown in red is always the predominating, or is typically the predominating um, phenotype of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, in the box here on the left, I show you the classic textbook teaching is that two to 5% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease have primary sclerosis and cholangitis. However, it's important to note that in a couple of the studies, uh, looking at long-term evaluation, screening of patients with inflammatory bowel disease, even if their liver tests are completely normal, when these patients get MRI, MRCP, we'll see an increase in the number of cases of PSC that are being picked up. And so we see three times more cases than, uh, than expected, indicating a large number of cases of undiagnosed uh, PSC or subclinical disease. What else the study showed us? Well, re regarding outcomes, uh, with the only caveat that the studies were very heterogeneous in which, uh, for instance, which populations they, they included, if there were only tertiary centers versus or community centers or all comers and what kind of information was collected in each study, right? But looking at the data available of the four studies that reported new cases of cirrhosis or what we call incident cirrhosis, that rate was 18.6 per thousand percent years, which is roughly uh, just below 2% per year. And among those patients, the rate of cirrhosis decompensation was about 9.7% in five years, going up to 31% in 20 years. Median time from diagnosis to therefore transplant is reported between 9.7 and 20 years. Again, depending on which population is being included. If we are focusing, selecting patients from a referral center that gets very sick, patients who need transplant, that time will be shorter. However, if we go out to the community and get all comers, then the time from diagnosis to transplant is much longer. Uh, the studies also show us cumulative relative 10-year survival rates, which go up to 90%, as you can see here, and looking to cause of death among patients with PSC, which is liver-related in about 80% of the cases, with malignancies really predominating and taking a good chunk here, cholangiocarcinoma, 
colon cancer, and there are some deaths from liver failure as well, patients who cannot get a transplant. So registries teach us a lot about the disease. Other, without going in too much uh, details, we can see that we can learn about risk factors for death or liver transplantation, risk factors for malignancy. So this study here on the right is from the International PSC study group. We had about 7,000 patients included. And in the panels, you can see uh, that, for instance, here in panel A, older patients, uh, those uh, males, those with classic PSC, meaning large duct disease, and patients with ulcerative colitis uh, were at higher risk for cumulative um, transplant or death, right, comparing to their counterparts, the younger patients, females, no inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and small duct PSC tend to do better. We learned that from registry studies, natural history studies. We can also learn, we can develop and validate prognostic models. We look at the effect of medications that are used in the real world, sometimes for another reason, and we look at the impact on PSC. For instance, we looked at how patients with PSC reacted to TNF blockers that are used for inflammatory bowel disease or how they reacted to vedolizumab which is also used for inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, if biobanking is available, then we can look at genomic characterization of the disease, both PSC and cholangial carcinoma, and we can look for biomarkers. This is a great interest of all of us, looking at molecules that can predict or correlate with outcomes, right? That can be potentially used as an endpoint in clinical trial, uh, such as the anti-glycoprotein 2, the PR3 ANCA, ELF and ProC3, and those, that's just to name a few. These all come from registry studies. All right, so now let's turn our attention to the North American Consortium. It's called Consortium for Autoimmune Liver Disease, or CALID. Currently, 19 sites are actively enrolling patients in CALID, and there are a couple others that are pending activation. You can see in the graph and the map that these sites are um, a, a, around the United States and Canada. And I have to thank Chris Bolus for um, lending me the slides on Khaled that I'm gonna to present today and also for leading us in this initiative. He's the chair uh, of Khaled. Okay, so currently as of March, 2022, this is our enrollment, 1,465 total subjects with 591 enrolled only in the retrospective portion and 874 patients enrolled both in the retrospective and prospective uh, phase of the study, so uh, with ongoing data collection. As a snapshot, this is of 850 patients, this is what we have, this is the demographics of our patients in Khaled. So age of diagnosis around 37, this is median value. A, a slight delay expected between that and the cholangiogram confirming the disease, age 39. Male predominance, 64%, as expected. This is the global um, epidemiology. Now, we're very proud that we were able to enroll. We have been able to enroll a very admixed population. 85% uh, of patients are white, and we have 10% African-Americans, 5% others and 7% of, of patients are Hispanic. UGCA use in this cohort is 67%. I emphasize the impact of race and ethnicity, the importance of having this diverse population because that has been an interest of ours. Early studies looking at the epidemiology of PSC coming from the Midwest of the United States or Northern European countries, as you can imagine, were very enriched with a Caucasian population, very rarely there would be an African-American patient. But in our real practices here, um, we often see black patients with PSC and their case series and reports indicating that probably their presentation and outcomes um, would be different from that of Caucasian patients. And we are interested in investigating, learning more about that. And this, uh, rapid communication from we prepared a few years back based on Khalid population, we were able to show that in fact, the proportion of PSC patients who are black 
correlates with the proportion of Blacks that live in the metropolitan area and in the catchment area for that center, that site. So just again, as a snapshot of those African-American patients with PSC, we could understand there's a hint here that they are really a different population. First of all, in terms of gender um, um, prevalence, we see that 51% of patients were male as opposed to that usual 64% that we see around the globe. 58.8% had inflammatory bowel disease and 52% had isolated intrahepatic involvement. We didn't talk much about this, but this is, so large duct PSC can involve just the extrahepatic ducts, the intrahepatic ducts, or both. And usually only 20 to 30% of patients have this isolated intrahepatic involvement. And now here we're seeing a little bit more in the black population. So going back to characterization of our cohort, in terms of age of a diagnosis and enrollment, there's no big difference between race and ethnicities. But again, numerically, we see fewer uh, black patients who are male. And then when we look at the phenotype of primary sclerosis and cholangitis and inflammatory bowel disease, we see some uh, difference. With respect to PSC phenotype, this was not statistically significant. We see a hint there that perhaps Black patients have fewer cases of small duct PSC, and Hispanics may have more of the overlap syndrome. Again, not statistically significant. We need to continue enrolling patients. As far as the IBD status, though, we already see, even with the small number of patients, a statistically significant difference with fewer Black patients having coexisting inflammatory bowel disease comparing to our Caucasian and Hispanic patients. Looking at our baseline laboratory tests for this population, there are some differences, but they are not that striking. We see lower albumin values, perhaps higher INR, lower hemoglobin values for black patients. The platelet count though was higher than for the Caucasians. So nothing really striking here, but unfortunately taking it all the way up to events, outcomes, we unfortunately see differences with our black patients tending to be more often listed for transplant, so are the Hispanics actually, and with more deaths among the African-Americans. So despite the fact that they are also undergoing transplantation. This was confirmed in the evaluation of survival by race. Uh, this is transplant-free survival Kaplan-Meier curves showing a difference with the African-Americans having lower survival rates. Overall, uh, hepatic decompensation was more common, but not statistic statistically significant, uh, this difference. Right, so we talk a lot about registries and how this is important to understand and learn about the disease. What does that mean? This is the workflow for us of what it is to participate in a natural history registry, not counting with all the work that happened before to develop a protocol and implement the actual study, right? But once the study is up and running, uh, there is the patient engagement phase. So it takes extra time for both the clinicians and the patients, especially the patients during that first visit when you're, you may be caught by surprise. You're there for a clinical visit and we're going to ask you about participation in this registry that can if you decide to participate that can be an extra hour maybe or more of your time to go through the steps um, to enroll in the registry of course when we're more organized we call you ahead of time ask you <laughs> to arrive early so that we have uh, time to do that um, then the coordinator will get the informed consent with us and we'll do the blood draw or phlebotomy um, process the specimen store. If you haven't had a fiber scan, we will do that at the time of enrollment because we want that baseline information. And then even after you leave and the specimen is processed and stored, we have the, the most time consuming aspect of this, which is to abstract all the data from the electronic medical records and enter that into the electronic databases, communicate with the coordinating site. And it doesn't end there because every so often we need to update the database with new 
labs, new tests that are being done. This may be done every six months or 12 months, depending on the protocol. So all this takes an enormous amount of time and cost. So it's always very challenging to conduct, but very worthwhile, as you could see from the results that we can get from this. So what are our plans for the future for Calid? Well, we definitely want to boost enrollment and ensure diversity. This is a priority for us. We want to utilize Calid as a platform to better understand phenotypic differences for PSC, treatment responses, and work with PSC partners through WIND. WIND is this opportunity to use a unified protocol around the globe with a standardized data collection form. You can imagine all of those databases I mentioned to you about, each one has a different protocol, different data that are being collected, different time points that are being uh, entered. But we want to standardize all of that, centralize data management and curation, and we will have funding to do that in a more structured way. So our goals are really aligned with WIND. We want to search for biomarkers that correlate with outcomes because ultimately that will give us endpoints for well-designed clinical trials that will give you new therapeutic options. That is our ultimate goal here, right? We can use this cohort as a control in clinical trials as well as in post-marketing studies. So even after a drug is approved, we need to get, um, even after the drug is approved, we need to confirm safety and efficacy. So that can avoid the placebo arm. And of course, we want to understand the burden of this disease for you, right? Understand the symptoms, how you respond to treatments, and use instruments that are validated in order to do that, the patient-reported outcomes, so we can ultimately improve the quality of your life. So in conclusion, uh, well-management patient registries are the best way to understand the disease. And there are several unmet needs for patients with PSC, which can be addressed through registries and the WIND project. Key questions for us are not only understanding the reasons for the various disease phenotypes, or the, how much of this is nature versus nurture, but more importantly, how can we minimize differences in outcomes, including across races and ethnicities, right? We want to look at markers for disease progression and malignancy and impact of symptoms and the available investigational treatments. So with that, I'm gonna conclude. I thank you for your attention. I wanna thank Chris Bolus for the slides again and PSC partners for uh, encouraging this type of study and allowing us to participate and present to you. Thank you very much. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Cyril Ponsjoen from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and this is a pre-recorded um, slideshow um, on patient-reported outcome measures. These are my disclosures, not very exciting. And this is the content of my presentation. I will um, get into um, uh, what, why, how, and which prompts are there on, um, on the market already. What are patient reported outcome measures uh, actually? Well, these are questionnaires gauging how a patient feels, what their symptoms are, and also into health rate, quality of life measures, directly measuring um, the, uh, from the patient themselves without the intervening um, potential bias of an interviewer, say a doctor or a nurse or a psychologist. The setting is either during office visits to a professional or more importantly, and with less bias in the home situations. And the situation can um, pertain to current symptoms or feelings or health rate quality of life measures. It could also concern past weeks, how patient felt, but it could also be um, uh, in the history. So did you ever have symptoms of blah, blah, blah? Why are patient reported outcome measures important? Well, first of all, for drug development. If you uh, look into the guidelines of the FDA, they um, claim that a clinically meaningful endpoint directly measures how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And this feels and functions 
uh, can of course um, nicely be measured by for instance patient reported outcome measures and these endpoints are important for drug development um, you have to know um, if a new thera therapeutic measure either a drug or uh, cognitive therapy or an operation of whatever device if it uh, has any benefit into how a patient feels functions or survives you have to have proper endpoints and some of these endpoints for instance symptom patterns cannot be gauged during office visits but you have to take them into the natural setting of a patient during his work during home um, uh, sometimes even during sleep and uh, these subjective measures can be more accurately measured with uh, high density mapping especially when it um, uh, when it pertains to symptom patterns so diurnal patterns or weekly patterns or even seasonal patterns with um, uh, techniques such as the experience sampling method which is a time-tested method in psychiatry and psychology um, where um, certain symptoms or feelings are measured during the um, home situation of a patient. And also nowadays, uh, new therapies uh, should also be uh, accompanied by so-called health technology assessment studies, which is uh, to see if a drug or uh, whatever measure is uh, cost-effective. And to give you an example, uh, cost-effectiveness analysis are measured in uh, quality adjusted life years, so-called qualities, where a 1.0 is one life year in full health and zero is death. It has a scale from minus 0.4 to plus uh, 0.953. So you can, situations can also be worse than even death. And it's um, usually measured with a so-called Eurocrawl 5D5L scale, which has five domains asking questions uh, regarding mobility, self-care, usual activities, pain or discomfort and anxiety, depression. And all these domains lend themselves ideally to be taken uh, by uh, patient reported outcome measures. Another reason why prompts are important is that they can um, uh, give an, an additional value into health-related quality of life measurements through generic questionnaires, such as, for instance, a short form 36. And again, these, um, this uh, EQ5D, in order to assess the level of health rate quality of life um, increase or decrease um, because of an illness in order to measure the assessment of the burden of disease, which is, for instance, important for allocation of healthcare resources. So they are important. And how should you develop them? Well, don't look too much into detail to this uh, cartoon. It just shows you that um, there's a lot of steps to be taken according to the FDA guideline for industry uh, for PROMS um, from December 2009, where you have several iterative steps to, um, to um, come up to um, uh, validated and um, handy PROM measurements and these uh, should be validated according to a lot of different criteria which you see here in this uh, way too, um, too um, lengthy uh, table regarding reliability, validity and ability to detect, to detect change. And this is just to show you that um, development and, and validation of patient reported outcome measures is quite a cumbersome um, process. Now, what kind of prompts do we have in PSC? Well, there are two specific PSC specific um, prompts developed already, the PSC Pro and the SCCS. There are a few IBD specific prompts, such as the um, simple um, clinical colitis activity index uh, for uh, ulcerative colitis and the HBI, the Harvey Bradshaw index for uh, Crohn's disease activity scoring. And we in the Netherlands have um, uh, validated a patient-derived SCCAI in a patient-derived HBI, and they are uh, very useful to, um, to um, apply um, and take them from patients themselves without the intervention of a doctor. And of course, there are a number of generic um, symptom scales, such as the fatigue impact scale, the 5D itch scale, and then the, the very much generic 
short form 36 and EQ5D5L, which measure uh, health rate and quality of life in general. This is uh, the uh, uh, paper presenting the um, PC Pro, which was developed in the slipstream of the uh, Simtuzumab trial from Gilead. And it concerns quite a lengthy uh, scale, which has uh, 42 items you have to answer over two um, different modules, like PC symptoms, for instance, if you take this one, the number three, it, it will ask a patient over the past 24 hours, how bad was the discomfort in your upper abdomen due to PC at its worst? Um, and you can sc score them from zero to 10. And there's another module which uh, tries to assess the um, impact of symptoms, scoring from one to uh, five. And this has uh, 29 different questions. In all these, these uh, comprise 42 questions. Uh, which takes you about 12 to 15 minutes to complete. And conversely, we developed in Amsterdam the uh, simple cholesterol complaints score and validated it. It was um, published recently in Liver International. Um, it is very simple. It has only uh, four different domains. It asks about pruritus, fatigue, right upper quadrant abdominal pain and fever and scores them from zero to four ranging from no to unbearable or all day in bed. It takes only 30 seconds and it proved to be very valid, which means that you have two scores now, one uh, more complicated, but uh, very specific one, um, which might be very applicable, applicable to uh, for clinical trials and one very, very uh, quick one which is uh, more applicable for um, uh, well daily daily patient care, but also to um, ask uh, questions uh, in a very uh, frequent way, like we do with a PSC app, which um, uh, we developed uh, a few years ago and which was also published uh, very recently uh, in April this year. And here you see an example. This app uh, gives push messages to the participants uh so they open the app they get two questions which they score with a fast score for instance here regarding the, the, the severity of itch and here the, the the time of the day you can select where the itch was at its worst and then you send them and it's there so this is a measure where you can um measure with a very high intensity so high density mapping uh different uh, questions regarding different symptoms and also medication intake and gives you a nice overview with a high density of disease or symptom patterns so um these are a few of the results where we found out after asking uh, almost 7000 questions over three months uh, periods in 137 patients about when they experienced their itch to be worse it turns out to be in the evening and also we could link this to uh, several um, uh, external um, circumstances like daily temperature and it turns out that um, there's an inverse relation between temperature outside temperature and uh, the degree of um, uh, of pruritus so uh, takeaways in concluding proms are important for future therapy development um, it's not very easy, it's cumbersome. You have to um, comply with very uh, a number of, um, of uh, requirements in order to get it validated for the regulatory authorities. There's now two partly validated uh, PROMs available, which are complementary to each other. Um, and with partly, I mean that they have been validated internally, but not in other populations, like in other languages. So that's the research agenda that these two um proms will be validated in other language populations and with that i thank you for your attention thank you doctors hirschfield levy and pension for uh these three excellent presentations before we turn to our panel discussion, I will now share information on the WIND initiative. 
Can we please share the slides? Next slide, please. So what is the WIND initiative? In very simple terms, WIND is a data collection initiative facilitated by PSD partners and sponsored by PSC partners through community funding. We plan for the data to be stored in a WIND database, a secure central repository of PSC natural history data, and with the intention to be a community resource for PSC partners, for PSC researchers, academic and drug development, for real world data and real world evidence for regulatory filings. Next slide. So why has PSC Partners prioritized the WIND initiative? So you've heard some of this story through other um, presentations uh, this weekend. In 2020, it was a time when, P when the FDA's growing emphasis on the inclusion of patient voice in drug development inspired PSC Partners to act upon this important focus on patient input. It was also a ripe time for PSC partners to apply for the competitive and substantial Rare as One grant. As you heard about yesterday from Drs. Korzenik and Pratt, with the partnership of Dr. Korzenik and Dr. Bolas, PSC partners was fortunately awarded this CZI grant, along with 20, uh, 29 other rare disease organizations. One mandate of the CZI grant has been to develop a patient-driven collaborative research network modeled after the Castleman Disease Collaborative Research Network, which you heard about yesterday in the keynote presentation. Patient-driven. Well, this means listening to the PSC patient community to determine priorities, basing our plans on what PSC patients consider to be most important to them. The breakout groups yesterday for feedback on the draft strategic research plan was one step in soliciting feedback from this community. In October of 2020, PSC Partners held an externally led PFDD meeting with the FDA to introduce the PSC patient journey to the FDA and to drug developers directly from patients in their own voices. You may remember the Our Voices survey that we launched to support the patient testimony. 850 patients responded to PSC Partners' call to take the Our Voices survey which captured many aspects of the PSC patient experience. It was loud and clear in the responses that overwhelmingly patients prioritized the development of treatments to slow down the progression of PSC. Keeping this patient identified priority in focus, PSC Partners aims to support the acceleration of PSC drug development through the WIND initiative. By developing WIND as a collaborative effort we, as PSC patients and patient representatives, can participate in the custodianship of PSC patient data and can pursue the explicit and important goal of sharing the data with researchers conducting PSC research. The very difficult journeys that PSC patients currently experience are key to understanding PSC. To not collect this lived experience in a way that it can be best used is to miss a precious opportunity to advance our understanding of PSC. If this data is carefully and systematically collected over time, it can serve to establish a reference of what happens without treatment. Today, we are most grateful for the clinical trials that are exploring potential treatments for PSC. We are also grateful to all of the patients who are joining clinical trials at their earliest safety testing stages and primary efficacy testing stages. With WIND, we aim to support these drug development efforts by being ready to optimize the chances for success of full approval of a drug by supporting the lengthy and challenging later phases of drug approval. Together with a consortium of project funders, the PSC Partners Board of Directors, and a working group of research advisors, we are working to make this opportunity a reality. Next slide, please. So um, this weekend alone, we have heard about many natural history study efforts from KLID in North America 
to the Toronto Mayo work that uh, Dr. Hirschfield just presented, scanned PSC that we heard about from Dr. Carlson, the IPSC registry that Dr. Poncion spoke about, among many others, large and robust, that we've not discussed yet this weekend. So what is unique about wind? Well, international. The W in the WIND acronym is for worldwide. We anticipate collecting data from sites in the US, Canada, and Europe. This will enable additional important diversity in the data set. Dr. Levy highlighted this need in her presentation. The plan is for a central database. The I in WIND is for integration. External control arm. How the data is collected is important. If we start with the intention for the data to be used as an external control arm and take the extra steps that are required for the data to meet regulatory requirements, we can meet this goal. Resourced for data collection to be prospective, collected at regular intervals, and maintained and audited in real time, this requires resources. And we are committing to a form to $4 million of financial support over five years. And finally, what we PSC partners bring is a singular focus on PSC, this funding and logistical support. Next slide, please. So um, specifically, what will this look like? We are planning for a prospective cohort sufficiently powered to understand biomarkers to enable the development of external control arms for clinical trials with a recruitment goal of 2023 PSC patients across all research sites. Next slide, please. Thank you to Ruth Ann Pye for sharing her slides and this uh, timeline schematic. We are pursuing the following aggressive timeline to accomplish the goals of WIND. I'm not going to go into detail uh, on this, but the points I'd like to make are the work to be completed before enrollment of patients includes formalizing a research protocol, developing data sharing agreements, establishing governance structure and data coordinating center, and contracting with individual sites. We hope to begin enrolling and then for now to plan to follow for five years. We hope to begin enrolling in 2023. So then by 2027, hopefully there will be enough data for interim analysis. And if all goes well, 2030 would be an aggressive goal to have five years of data on 2000 patients for multiple centers. So the point is this is a long-term project. Next slide, please. Here, here we show the summary of the three scientific aims that have been identified. Aim one, development of a large biomarker data set with the aim of identifying associations with clinical endpoints. Aim two, data collection to enable the creation of external control arms. And aim three, development of validated patient reported outcome measures to better understand the burden of disease. Next slide, please. Of course, none of these efforts would be possible without the guidance of expert researchers with experience in leading and building natural history studies and who are working collaboratively to guide the planning of this project. I'd like to acknowledge the working group regional leads. It's Dr. Cynthia Levy for the US, Dr. Gideon Hirschfield for Canada, and Dr. Cyril Poncion from Europe. Um, they each provide crucial guidance on development of this effort and on the unique needs of their region. They are part of the prospective cohort working group of 15 members that has now met five times together. Thank you to Dr. Chris Bolas, uh, one of the working group members who will be joining us today for the next session, the panel discussion. PSC Partners is and will seek guidance and direction from industry and regulatory agencies to ensure that we maximize the ways this data can be utilized for drug development purposes. Next slide, please. We, would, we will be pursuing formal contract relationships with research sites interested in contributing to the WIND cohort. A large portion of the funding will go to support these sites in recruitment, data collecting, and follow-up. Some of the elements that will be considered in selection of sites are success and rigor of previous efforts to collect natural history registry data, the need and ability of sites to collect and store biospecimens, patient demographics and disease state, aiming for diversity and stratification, the ability to follow up for five to seven years. 
the ability to collect the, the, all of the data elements that get selected for the protocol. For example, if FibroScan is in the protocol, we will need centers that have access to FibroScan. Input from consortium representatives, working group members, and regional leads. Next slide, please. So the takeaways are that WIND is an initiative to build an international prospective natural history cohort of 2,000 or more patients and to follow them for five years. The launch is funded by PSC Partners Community Support, Biomarker Development, External Control Arms, and Patient Reported Outcome Measures are the three aims. And it's very important for us to be enrolling a diverse population of patients. Next slide, please. Takeaway two is that this is a progression of over two decades of natural history work in PSC by the research community. And we are so grateful for the work that has already been done. And we thank them for their contributions in planning this project. Next slide, please. And finally, at this point, WIND is an opportunity for a unified protocol, standardized data collection, centralized data management and curation. I'd like to point out that for, for patients who participate, it is a low burden. The point is that the effort is to translate what is already happening in these patients' life into data that can be used for research. And this is an ambitious project. And if successful, it will pay dividends, but it will need time, patience, patience, and lots of organization. Thank you very much. Um, so we are now, next slide, please. We are now going to transition over to the WIND think tank session. We're gonna close out this room. So everybody, please take your questions. We are going to have a panel discussion moderated by Dr. Ver Veronica Miller. We'll, we'll be joined by Dr. Gideon Hirschfield and Dr. Chris Bolas. So thank you so much. And um, we will see you over at the WIND think tank session.